We're reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Reading from the ESV. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For he saw his star, for we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Thanks, Pete. Well, thank you, Finn. Thank you, worship team. As I wander around and, and talk to folk, <clears throat> and I'm sure you're the same, you will have noticed, I'm sure, that many people are anxious, uncertain, confused, disturbed. You wake up in the morning and you don't know whether you're going to be able to visit mum that day or whether you need to put a mask on, whether you can fly as you've already booked your flight. It's, it's, a, it's a tough time because we love certainty in our lives. Humanity likes certainty. Well, let me encourage you this morning. Even if all the world is shifting sand, we have certainty in our Savior. We have certainty in our God with whom there is no shadow of turning. The unchangeable I am. And in his word, his word, the unchangeable, immutable word of God upon these things, you can put your trust and you can have confidence even today because of that. Nothing to do with my message. I just felt to share that this morning. I'm sure that some folk just needed to hear that. Last week, for those of you who were here, and by the way, can I just say a very warm welcome to our visitors this morning. It was lovely to meet you uh, as you came down, came through the aisle there. I just uh, hope you really have a, had a wonderful time of worship and, and pray that this message will, will speak deeply to your hearts. Last week, we, we looked at Matthew chapter 1, and we saw there the genealogy of the Lord. And it's from that genealogy that we were able to ascertain a few things about God, the king, and his kingdom coming. And of course, we saw, my goodness gracious, there's a few rogues in that lineage, aren't there? There's some rat bags. Makes me feel all right now. But it's because of that that we, we learned that God was a, an accepting God. He was a God who looked past our faults as to what we could be, not what we were. We learned that he's a faithful God because he, 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 he fulfilled those prophecies to both David and to Abraham, those promises that through Abraham the, the world would be blessed and through David there would not be a king missing from the throne. And I think... That's probably the most important aspect that Matthew wanted to bring out was these, these prophetic fulfillments. And Luke, likewise, in, his opening, in the opening of his gospel, he confirms the very same thing. He says that Jesus is indeed this long-awaited Davidic king. Luke 1, 31 to 33 says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's the promise right there. 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom and of his kingdom there will be no end. Today as we look at chapter two of Matthew's gospel, I want us to see three different responses to the report and to the arrival of the Messiah, this this Jesus, the the king who came from this Davidic line. Now, you know, everybody at some time must come to an informed and personal decision as to who this Jesus is. And not only that, but they must determine what response is required of them in the light of that truth, that understanding. This morning, we're going to take a look first at the response of King Herod, whom we first meet, of course, in verse 1. Let's read together Matthew 1 to 3, chapter 2, 1 to 3. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And so verse 3, we find our, uh, our first and our initial response from Herod to hearing about this new kid on the block who was going to be born king of the Jews and, of course, by implication, Messiah. Herod had been called king of the Jews because uh, under the Roman uh, Empire, he was ruling through Judea. But no one had ever called him Messiah. Matthew tells us that his initial response was that he was troubled. Now, that doesn't sound too bad. Uh, The intent there is uh, to stir up, to disturb. You could imagine uh, walking through a lovely clear pond or a stream and and maybe a little bit of a muddy bottom and, and it stirs it up and disturbs the bottom. That's kind of what it speaks to there. But of course, that was only his initial response. And this is only our first time hearing about King Herod. But as we read on in verse 3, we come across another interesting claim that in fact, all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. Now, it's actually from that statement that we can uh, perhaps again, or glean a little understanding about King Herod. After all, why would Jerusalem be troubled? Had they not known the prophecies? Were they not expecting Messiah to be born? They knew where? Should this not have been an announcement of great joy for the people of God? But what's happened is that these very simple Jewish folk had grown tired and not a little bit complacent, perhaps, in their religious fervor. They simply wanted to live in peace and not to feel the threat of a, uh, and terror of a tyrannical and unstable ruler. Such Herod was. Their their troubling was more a response to this highly reactive ruler who had over the years grown very suspicious and paranoid about people trying to usurp his authority. He was incredibly insecure and brutal towards any who challenged his authority, even murdering those of his own family who he felt were threats. So most likely the Jews living in Jerusalem were more concerned about their lifestyle of peaceful living being jeopardized because of Herod's irrational retribution. But as we read further on, we we find that Herod's 
response actually deepens and his troubling actually transforms and manifests itself in a a demonic escalation uh, of a vile, murderous plot against this child. Herod's response was one of hatred and fear. Hatred and fear. Perhaps two of the most destructive and dangerous sentiments to inhabit the heart of mankind. And so often spoken of against by the Lord himself. In fact, this is a classic example of Jesus' teaching. Matthew 5, we, we read, You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And again in Luke 6, we read, Blessed are you when, me, when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. But Herod's hatred and fear was driven and mobilized most effectively by his deep desire for power. And power still has that same corrupting tendency today as it did in first century Palestine. We see how this insatiable lust for control over his human, uh, over his fellow man, it took root, and we've seen it take root also in Germany's Hitler, in Russia's Mussolini, uh, Stalin, in in Iraq's Saddam, and Serbia's Milosevic, and every other despot and dictator who ever drew breath. Our responses are often the best indicator as to the condition and motivation of our own heart. One other theme which is prominent in Matthew's short account is that of contrast. And there's a very strong and a clear contrast between Herod's kingship and Jesus' Kingship, one inaugurated by Rome, an alien power based on aggression and cruelty, the other originating from love, shown in vulnerability, and entering into the kingdom by the cross. Herod was 33 at his inauguration, so was Jesus. The one in a fit of rage and jealous fury set out to kill off this child, obviously inspired, no doubt, by Satan himself. The other, the Christ child, came to bring life and to give his life a ransom for many. His motivation and leading came only from the God of love, the heavenly father. What then does our life look like? What what are our responses to this revelation of Christ and his demands upon our life? How can we ensure that our responses to God, his promises and commandments as we read in the word are righteous and loving and honoring to him? Well, first of all, you've got to know him. And before that, you have to recognize that you're a fallen, sinful person who has need of a savior. And that's one of the problems today, folks. The world out there doesn't think it's a sinning world. So what does it need saving from? Thank God he's opened our eyes to the fact of our mortality and the darkness of our hearts. But then as a born again child of God, we need to continually put to death the deeds of our flesh, which can only be done by the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
As we saw in Herod, he wanted to rule over people, but Jesus said to be a servant to all, to prefer our brothers and our sisters, to love without limit. Well, we've seen Herod's response to the Christ child. Our second response can be seen in those who have been entrusted with the Holy Scriptures. Those uh, who are tasked with teaching and building up the spiritual condition of the people of Israel. That is the scribes and the chief priests. We read in verse 4 that being troubled at this news, he assembled and gathered together the chief priests and scribes to try to ascertain where this child was going to be born. And we see that these Jewish leaders knew exactly where, definitely knew their scriptures, and they were able to point Herod uh, to uh, uh, Micah chapter 5, pointing out where he would be born, which is also written in Matthew 2, 6, recorded there. And it says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. What stands out to even, I guess, the casual reader is the lack of excitement, the lack of engagement with this search for the Messiah by these Jewish teachers of the law. There seemed to be no desire to involve themselves anymore, but to remain aloof and apathetic to the whole idea of his arrival. They knew it all, but did nothing. They knew the text, but failed to engage with it. And this is a very real danger for anyone who thinks that knowing about God is sufficient to secure salvation. It's easy to see as we read on in the various gospel accounts that the apathy so consumed them in the early years actually turned into bitter oppression to Jesus as he developed his ministry. One commentator called it a frenzied lust for his blood. This is for all of us, I believe, a stark warning. That's knowledge. Knowledge is no substitute for obedience. There will be two great threats to the church in coming days. Today, perhaps even. The first is open hostility and persecution. The second, I believe, much more insidious is apathy. Apathy will kill our faith and make us weak in our walk with the Lord. And so to our third and final response from this chapter of Matthew, where we find in verse 1, wise men who had come from the east to Jerusalem to search for this child who had been born king of the Jews. Perhaps it's helpful to clarify a little around these, these men. They were not kings, and most likely there were more than just three of them. Uh, that legend most likely evolved from the three gifts, and so we ended up with three kings, three wise men. In fact, um, they probably uh, traveled in groups of uh, up to a dozen men in a troop, maybe 20, and they were known as magi. I like how John Piper describes them. He says, here the first worshippers are court magicians or astrologers or wise men, not from Israel, but from the east, perhaps from Babylon. They were Gentiles, unclean. And at the end of Matthew, the last words of Jesus are, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all men, of all nations. 
What Piper is alluding to here is the fact that these first worshippers came to Christ and they were Gentiles. And that that fact was a tell, a sign that God's salvation was to be offered to all men, not just to the Jewish nation. Isn't it ironic that God's own people who knew the prophecies, who were expecting a Messiah and had been entrusted with the sacred scriptures, missed his arrival completely. They did not welcome him with worship and adoration, but rather with derision and open hatred. Of course, this was all known to God. As we read in John 1.11, he came to his own and his people did not receive him. And from Isaiah 53 and 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom they hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. This all makes the Magi response all the more startling. The first response we note is that having become aware of his imminent arrival, they sought him out. That was no mean feat. It would have taken a lot of planning, a lot of determination, commitment and preparation, not to mention personal cost. So... One, they sought the Savior. Their motivation? They came to worship. They came to present gifts to him. And it's fitting uh, that Matthew reveals something of the nature of those gifts because they speak very clearly into the theme of kingly fulfillment through prophecy. Let's take a quick look at them. And I'm sure many of you uh, have studied it, but those who haven't, Gold. Gold is, of course, the most fitting gift for any king. And you remember verse 2, they described the Christ child who had been born king of the Jews. Gold was a fitting, fitting gift for this king. Interesting to note here, normally people inherit the kingly role, a reign. But here, Christ was king at his birth. He had always been and will always be King Jesus. Frankincense was a spiced resin which was burnt by the priests in the temple. It was used during the offering. And we can appreciate how fitting it was that our ultimate high priest, who would not only offer the ultimate uh, sacrifice for reconciliation between man and God, but he was that very sacrifice. The perfect lamb of God. The third gift they brought was myrrh. This was a particularly aromatic resin which was ground and mixed with oils and made into a a perfume and, and sometimes it was used as a medicine but it was most often used as an embalming oil at funerals. So in addition to the honour and status implied by the value of the gifts of the Magi, there lies in their choosing of these gifts spiritual symbolism that's important for Jesus himself. One, gold representing his kingship. Frankincense, a symbol of his priestly role and myrrh prefiguring his death and embalming. I want to go back just a little bit and pick up on one of the responses which I think is exceptional from verse 10. Verse 10, this is the response from the Magi. When the star stopped above the place where Jesus lay, and when they saw the star They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. 
this line or description of overwhelming joy has captured the heart of many over the years. For many, it's become a favorite Christmas song. I try to imagine what kind of joy this must be, this exceeding great joy. Have you ever wondered? A joy that almost any other joy It just blows it out of the water. A joy that so fills the heart, it overflows. A a joy that is so complete, so perfect, that in the light, it's in a light which illuminates the darkness and reveals everything which had been hidden in the shadows. This joy, not just a great joy, an exceedingly great joy. I believe that we're captivated today by the thought of such joy because it is often the opposite of what we do experience in this world, the side of glory, right? In our daily lives. I'm convinced that every single person's heart and soul yearns for joy. Perhaps that's why we pursue these pursuits, substances, experiences, those things which give us a temporal hit of pseudo joy, temporal joy. Nehemiah 8 says, then he said to them, go on your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine and send portions to everyone as uh, everyone who has need for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There comes a strength from knowing the joy of the Lord. Where does it come from? Psalm 4 and 7. You have put more joy in my heart than when the grain and new wine abounds. It comes from the Lord. Not only that, it trumps any other joy that you can have. I wonder this morning if if you're recognized as a person who is full of joy, or are you struggling with unhelpful emotions, negativeness? It was the star which now stood above the place where the baby lay, which caused this almost ecstatic sense of elation. Why? Because it symbolized the journey is over. We've found him. And they would now be able to see and worship and honor the King of Jews and the Savior of the world. I would like you to see something here. These magi, these wise men, these astrologers. They didn't just stumble across Jesus one day as they were busy about their daily tasks, their worldly pursuits. They had intentionally set out to find him, counting the cost. And indeed, there was a cost. And friend, today, if you will seek after Christ wholeheartedly, and allow him to rule as king, as Lord in your life, it will cost you. And that cost will be different for each one. The Lord himself said that, uh, that uh, children will turn against parents and vice versa. A man's enemies will be the members of his own family. Friends, it might cost you a career, or like so many, who have already gone before us, it may well cost their lives. Yet despite that, Jesus said, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek for me with all of your heart. And remember, he also said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm sure there isn't one person here who, like Herod, hates Jesus Christ. But sadly, it's quite likely that one or two 
They have allowed the circumstances of life to trample on the joy that you've had in your heart. And you may have become jaded in your walk, in your faith. Sometimes when life gets hard, we can lose our spiritual compass. The stuff of this world turns our heads away from the truths of the word of God. And we begin to drift like a ship without a rudder. We tend to trust more in our own ability than lean on the Lord to the point where thoughts of God become less frequent and less important. And so the response with which Matthew has illuminated so well for us in this passage is that of the wise men. The Magi who traveled far at great personal cost, through great danger, having intentionally sought him, they fell before him and worshipped and honored the king and savior of the world. If you have not met the king yet, let one of us today here who knows him be that star who can guide you to the Christ, the King, the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Our loving God and our Father, we thank you. At this season in the year that we consider more than any other the, the birth, the incarnation, the breaking in to humanity of divinity. Our Savior came for one purpose, to seek and to save that which is lost. He came not to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. Father, I pray for those here today because this is a hard season in our history. Lord, there's confusion, there's trouble. There's so much that can take our eyes from Christ and cause us to be like those ships with no rudders. Father, help us today to remember the Christ child, to remember the word which you've given us, for all your promises are yea and amen in Christ. May we ever set our hearts and minds on the Savior of our souls, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.